Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. In today's episode, we are going to be working on the front brakes and we're going to be upgrading the battery on our F3XX track bike build. Welcome back guys. So like I said, today we're going to be working on the front brakes. Nothing special. We're just swapping out the lines that on there for a slightly shorter line. The other thing we're doing is we are upgrading our battery. So this bike already had a lightweight, a lightweight lithium ion anti-gravity battery. However, um, one of you awesome subscribers said, hey Derek, check out, I think it's Solise or Solise, uh, French battery manufacturer. He said they make super small batteries, super light, and uh, can crank over your bike. You'll save some more weight. So I looked into them and um, actually I ended up going with this diminutive little guy here. This is the anti-gravity XPS SC1. So in size, for a size comparison, <laughs> you could see these things. This is microscopic. In comparison to the multi-cell anti-gravity here so I'll put the specs up on the screen for the SE one right now that way you guys don't say that I'm lying or I don't know what I'm talking about and I don't misspeak but um, this is a four cell uh, 12 volt battery um, and it's marketed as a race spec battery because it doesn't have any battery battery management systems in it so no BMS at all so you can overcharge and you can over drain this battery if you don't know what you're doing as a result you'll want to make sure that you get a proper battery charger like this optimate here um, this is specifically made for charging lithium batteries and it has protection in it so that once the battery is fully charged it stops and won't overcharge the battery and then it will just maintain it um, anti-gravity also says that this battery can sit you know, in a corner without any um, parasitic draw on it for several years before it loses any charge. So awesome, light little thing, but um, let's head on over to my desk real quick and I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, guys, we're over here at my desk. As you can see, we have three batteries. We have our anti-gravity XPS SC1. We have our anti-gravity ATZ-10 uh, and my um, old Scorpion battery. I love these. I I've had really good success using the Scorpion lithium ba batteries. They offer great cranking power and they're less weight than the anti-gravity. So both of these weigh in the area of two pounds. I think they're within a few uh, ounces of one another, but this one, the Scorpion has way more cranking uh, power than this one uh, from anti-gravity. Both of them are, as you can see, way bigger than our XPS. So we're gonna weigh all of these guys. Like I said, I don't have a standard lead acid battery over here, um, but those typically weigh in the area of six to seven pounds. Um, so keep that in mind when we're looking at uh, weights here. So first up, we'll do our Scorpion battery. This has all the mounting hardware on it. And this is one pound, 15.6 ounces, one pound, 15.6 ounces. So, uh, what is that? 0.4 ounces below two pounds. So we'll weigh that one more time. One pound, 15.6 ounces again. So pretty consistent. So we'll round that up to, and say two pounds. We now have our, our anti-gravity lithium ion battery. This is two pounds, 1.6, 1.7 ounces so again a tad heavier than our scorpion battery we'll do that one more time again two pounds 1.6 ounces so again we can round that down to two pounds if you want and then our xps this is 13.7 ounces so not even a full pound we're still more than two ounces away from a full pound. So 16 ounces is a pound. 13.6 ounces. So 
what that's basically saying is we just dropped a pound of weight over our current anti-gravity um, lithium ion battery and if we're comparing that to a lead acid battery we just lost roughly five to six pounds off the bike now having said that i, I i'll mention again that this is um, marketed as a race spec battery because there's no battery management system in it. So it's not intended to be used on a street bike. However, if you do some research, you'll find, you'll find some reviews where users have in fact installed this on their street bike. And I think the average length of time that you get out of this battery in a street application is about uh, two years, roughly 24 months. But I wouldn't expect anything more than that because again, it's not intended for that. Um, in addition, let me turn this off, so I'll stop. So anti-gravity says this can be used in applications up to 1300 cc's, so it shouldn't have any problems turning over our, um, our 800 cc inline three MV Agusta. Um, also, there's a video out there of um, anti-gravity using this bike to turn over a big American V8 engine. So. This bike, uh, this battery has plenty of cranking power, again, with 150 cranking amps out of a four cell tiny battery. These are typically anywhere from 12 to 16 cells. So, um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, it should help us out a lot. And like I said, uh, we just lost a pound. The, the, the pound that we gained <laughs> by adding uh, our i2m chrome pro 2 stuff or our oz racing wheels because if you remember the rear oz racing wheel was one pound heavier than the one that came off the bike we just saved that weight right here by installing this diminutive tiny little battery so my plan for installing this in the bike is to use these heavy duty zip ties ironically um Every battery tray that you can buy for this online is made out of either steel or alum aluminum. And um, all of them are as heavy or heavier than the battery itself. So the last thing I wanted to do was, you know, scale down to this lightweight battery and then put it in a battery tray that just adds all that weight back. It, I would have, if that was the case, I would have just stayed with the anti-gravity, the larger anti-gravity battery here. Anyway, so here is the stock battery tray with some foam already installed. It installs like this, so the air box is here and the rear of the bike is here um, and it sits in this way. You can see I've drilled a hole here to allow the large zip tie to pass through it. The large zip tie will pass around the frame. This will install in here. I plan on putting a little double-sided stick tape here, but uh, this will wrap around and cinch this down and I've already tested it and checked it. It's not going anywhere. Um, as an added precaution, we could add some foam over here so that it doesn't move left to right. But trust me, with a double-sided stick tape, the padded bottom and the um, heavy-duty zip tie going over it, it's not going anywhere. So that's what I plan to do. Let's head on over the bike and put this in. So I'm going to just pass this around the frame. There's a wiring harness um, that sits right under this frame. So I'm going behind the frame, but in front of the wiring harness, so I don't capture it here. So I've just pushed the wiring harness a little bit forward and had this come behind it, I guess. So we'll slide that down like that, and this will come up through the hole in the battery box. All right, battery box is installed. All right, so with the battery tray reinstalled, we are ready to install our XPS anti-gravity battery. Um, there are positive and negative sides, so positive is red, negative is marked with uh, green, so we wanna put it on this side so the negative is on the left, positive is on the right. It's going to go in here just like that. Um, by the way, at some point, I'm going to be reinstalling this battery in the subframe in the tail section in this area here. Uh, hopefully you can see that. I, I need some brackets so I can mount to the bottom side of this so that it's suspended and secured in some type of way and it won't move around. That way, all I'll have to do is remove this rear, um, rear subframe clamshell here, just slide that off, unbolt it obviously, slide it off. And this should give me access to the battery and the battery terminals. I'll be able to quickly disconnect, remove the battery, replace it, 
and do what I need to do with the battery without removing the fuel tank. So at some point, I'll have to fabricate a bracket and that's going to go here. But for the time being, we're going to install it in the stock battery location. Our zip tie. Like that. That battery is not moving. All right, we're ready to make our connections here. So this is a negative cable. This comes on over this way. Okay, so we have our connections for our Optimate trickle charger, our connections for our i2M Chrome Pro 2, and then just the um, battery cables for the bike. So not a whole lot connected to this bike. Grab that, that. All right. This, we'll talk in the battery box like that. We will put our ECU back in place. And like I said, this is the connector for our fuel tank and our pigtails over here for the Optimate battery charger. Let's see if we got juice. No juice still. Ugh. A few moments later. Well, that sucks. So our I2M positive line popped off the end here so I'll need to resolder that with this shorty line here um, but that's a simple fix all right so I've made the repair to the i2m positive line here so now we could test to see if we have power and we do and we have a display so we are good there I've already gone ahead and plugged in our optimate trickle charger so now we can turn our attention to the front brakes. All right, guys, sorry about that. I know it wasn't a big deal for you, but it's a few days later, as you can tell. Um, life happened, so I had to step away from the bike for a couple of days, but we can uh, finally get back to it and turn our attention to the front brakes again. The reason I'm changing out the brake lines is that these lines are a little bit too long, particularly over here on the right side. Because of how the interior side of the right side uh, fairing is shaped, um, when you're turning the handlebars, you know, left, right, lock to lock, what's happening is this line is getting bunched up and it's getting caught and it's uh, inhibiting movement of the, the forks left to right and, and actually navigating and steering the bike. So I'm just going to be throwing this line on, which is a lot shorter. So short, in fact, particularly on the left side that I had to, had to order a new shorty line. So this should help us on the left side. And while I'm at it, I figured I'd throw on this Stabless um, Quick Bleeder for our brake master cylinder up here because I really enjoy these. These work a lot better than any of the other um, speed bleeders I've used in the past. Obviously, I have a set on both the calipers here and it just made sense that I put one up here on the brake master cylinder. So. Quick stuff, first thing I need to do is um, I need to obviously evacuate all the fluid from the lines. So I'm gonna be using this vacuum pump here along with my air compressor to at first initially suck the fluid out of the reservoir and then I will do the same from each caliper. Okay, so now that the brake lines have been evacuated of all the fluids, now we can go about changing the fluid, which is just a matter of disconnecting it from the brake master cylinder and the calipers. Simple stuff.
All right, guys, with our replacement brake lines all installed, you can see how they fit nice and close to the fork tubes now. Now we don't have all that bunching over here like we used to have on the right side that was coming into contact with the inside of our fairing and causing it to get hung up and so forth. Now they fit nice and snug to the fork tubes, and all I need to do now is just fill and bleed the system. Um, speaking of bleeding the system, we installed our stall bus uh, quick bleeder up here to go with the same bleeders that we have on our Akasato calipers. I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. I'm singing their praises. I love these bleeder valves. Um, Stallbus isn't paying me to do this. They didn't send me these for free. I paid for them with my own cash, but they are a great product that you guys could really really uh, should, should look into getting for your bikes. Um, if you do any type of bleeding or maintenance on your bikes, um, I think these are well worth the price of admission. Um, they take out the process of having to pump, 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 hold, open the valve, close the valve, pump, 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 hold, open the valve, close the valve. That's no longer needed. All you need to do is do a, a quarter turn of the top of the valve and just pump. No longer do you have to worry about air being sucked back into the system because of the valve. There's a ball valve in there that opens and closes with pressure. So every time we squeeze the lever, pressure is being forced um, through the valve. So fluid and air are forced out of that valve. And then when we release the lever, the ball valve closes and doesn't allow air to come back in. So there's no more pump, 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 open, close, pump, 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 open, close. We can just pump. Watch the fluid level in our reservoir to make sure it doesn't drop too low. Fill it as necessary and then we can pump. And as we pump, it'll force fluid and air out of the system. And eventually, it may still take a while because um, air can get trapped in the calipers. Sometimes it could hide in the lines if there are bends and kinks. Or sometimes it could just, you know, get hung up somewhere in our brake master cylinder. So it will still take some time, but um, it'll take a lot less time because, and it's a lot less aggravating uh, because we don't have to do this. It's no longer a two-person job. So sometimes if you don't have the reach and you can't do one of these, Sometimes you may have to have a second person over there at the caliper manning that caliper as you pump, 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 and they open and close the valve and then you let, you know, do that thing. Awesome product, they always work. I think this is the fourth or fifth bike I've used these bleeder valves on and I've never had any of them fail. I've used them on calipers, brake master cylinders now, clutch, slave, and master cylinders, as well as the rear calipers in the, on the bikes as well. So. Um, 100% uh, working rate with me, 0% failure rate with these particular valves, which is not the case <laughs> with the Speed Bleeder branded uh, valves uh, that I've used in the past. So, But anyway, what do you say we uh, give this a start before we wrap this episode up? guys there you go she still sounds a little bit eh because uh one the db killer's in it and two she's probably still running super lean because she hasn't been tuned and she's gulping in lots of air and um probably isn't dumping in enough fuel to uh to accommodate but uh we'll get that worked out in the coming weeks before she gets back out on the track um unfortunately i cannot remove the db killer because my local track has a uh, sound decibel limit and if i remove the db killer she most likely won't pass. So um, that's disappointing, but uh, it is what it is. But uh, we can wrap up this episode. I am Derek. This is Euro Superbike Life. Until next time, guys, take care.